In this tour, we're going to look at the Deepwater Horizon oil spill and its relationship to global warming and the oil tar sands in Canada. First, we'll fly into the site of the disaster. On April the 20th of this year, an explosion on the Deepwater Horizon rig was followed by the failure of standard backup equipment to seal the well in the case of an emergency. This led to oil gushing into the sea. This is a SketchUp produced model of the rig put in place. To give you an idea of the size of the rig, I've put it beside Nelson's column in London, which is sunk off the side of the rig here. If we fly away from the rig and under the water, you can also see the incredible depth the oil rig was operating in. Just under a mile deep, Nelson's column is tiny by comparison. This is the main reason BP have had so much difficulty stopping the oil from escaping from the rig. It's an at an incredible depth, making engineering operations very difficult. We're now flying out to view the oil spill spread. As a measure of scale, I've put the outline of the UK next to the spill site. And you can see dates illustrated on the timeline at the top. The oil slick size can be seen as it was on the 1st of May, 3rd of May, 4th of May, 5th of May, 6th of May, and finally on June the 8th. As you can see, by the 8th of June of this year, the oil had spread out over an area equivalent in size to most of South East England, one of the biggest oil spills in history. We're now flying into one of the affected areas to see the environmental damage the oil has done. This is the Grand Isle off the coast of Louisiana, and these oil birds were rescued by a charity operating in the area. It's just one example of the effect of the oil on the environment in the Gulf. I'll give you links to other resources about the environmental problem at the end of the tour. Flying back out to see the whole of the Gulf, we're now flying up to a position above the middle of the United States, and we're going to take you north to Canada to investigate what are known as the Athabasca oil sands. This is an image of a river cliff. The oil sands are the grey material the men are walking through. It's a mix of crude oil and sand, and unlike the reservoir rocks in the Gulf, the oil doesn't naturally drain out of the sand. It's similar to the way a towel can be damp but not drip when hung out. To get the oil out, they basically heat it up to make the oil less viscous, which can then be separated from the sand. We're now flying closer into the area of the Athabasca sands in Alberta, Canada. This overlay image is of the oil sand leases. The Canadian government has sold off rights to extract oil in the area. I'm showing it to you to give you a sense of scale of the area covered. If we fly back out again, you can see that I've produced another outline of Great Britain, so you can compare relative areas against each other. Flying back in, I'm turning off the outline of Great Britain and the mining lease map and turning on an overlay of what the area looked like before the mining began in the area. This overlay is a satellite image of the area from 1974, and it shows large areas of pristine forest and wetland, rather like in this photo. Now we're going to switch back to the present. You can see large areas of the forest have disappeared to make way for the oil mining. Let's fly north to look at a particular mine in more detail. We're looking at the Syncrude Aurora Mine. The line on the bottom is five miles long. On the left, you can see the mined area. On the right is the tailings pond. The oil sands are processed using heat and water. Once the oil has been separated out, the contaminated water is released into the tailings pond to contain it. Now it looks a mess, but what oil sand campaigners won't tell you is that the mining companies are legally required to return the area to its previous condition after they've finished mining it. I'll leave you to decide if that will actually happen or not. We're now flying in for a closer look at some of the processing machinery. The image shows you how completely man-made the mined area has become. We're now flying back out of the Athabasca oil sands area and from here in Canada back to a point in view of both areas to consider the two stories at the same time. The Gulf oil spill is one of the worst in history and the environmental damage will last years if not decades into the future. 
it looks likely that American oil reserves in the deep water gulf will not be exploited in the future. As of July 2010, USA is still arguably the largest user of oil in the world. So this loss of supply will need to be made up from somewhere, certainly in the short term. Despite the environmental problems related to oil strip mining in Athabasca, this area has the potential to make up the difference between America's oil need and its oil supply. The oil sands make Canada the country with the second largest oil reserve in the world after Saudi Arabia, and there are already pipelines taking that oil deep into the heart of America. However, there is a problem with this. Because oil from oil sands needs to be cooked to get it out of the ground, it produces much more carbon dioxide per barrel than most other oil sources. It truly deserves the title, the world's dirtiest oil. What America really needs to do is to move away from using oil as fast as it can, completely replacing its energy needs with renewable energy.